We are going to be in James today. So turn to James. I want to read the passage uh, that we'll be looking at. James chapter 3. Verse 13. The heading of my Bible has two kinds of wisdom. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly and spiritual demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. <coughs> Once upon a time, there was a wise old man who lived in the village far away. And this wise old man was known throughout the region for his, his wisdom. People came from all over to, to, to get advice from him, to seek out his knowledge and, and what he had to say. And one day a young man came to him, and the young man walked in and, and said, my life is just so burdensome. It, it feels like I'm... I'm I've got so many problems and, and, and it feels like I've got this big bag that I'm carrying around full of problems and, and it's just a huge burden. And then the, the wise old man said, I, I think we can find the solution together. But first, let's go down to the river. And so they walked down to the river and there the old man gave him a basket, and, you know, a, a weaved basket like an Easter basket. And, and he told the young man, he said, dip the basket in the water and, and, and get water in the basket. And the young man did so, but of course it's a, it's a wee basket. The water just ran right out and the, the young man was confused. And, but the old man went on and he said, life is like a river. It's always flowing. And, and the problems that we have are part of the flow of the river. And, and what you need to do is to learn to let the problems just flow out of your basket and, and, and go away. You know, that's how we often think of wisdom. Wisdom is some sort of cutesy sort of saying that, that people say that you're supposed to get something out of it and you're supposed to understand life better and and let your problems go and let them flow out of your basket and just get along with the river of life. And there is some stuff in the Bible that kind of looks like that sometimes. We're going through Proverbs as, as a men's group and, and some of the Proverbs are just like short QC sayings that, that we look at and we go, okay, that's memorable and, and there's an application there for me and so forth. What I'm saying is that often we think it is wisdom as being something that's just purely knowledge-based, it's mental, okay? You, you need to know stuff and know how that stuff applies to your life. Well, James is going to give us a little bit different um, aspect of wisdom, okay? He's going to show us a different facet of this diamond that we call wisdom. And he's going to do it by showing us that there are two types of wisdom, worldly wisdom and godly wisdom. But he's also going to show us that it's not just about um, what we know and, and the little proverb here and there and so forth and, and the wise advice that we can give somebody. 
It's also about the actions that we have, the attitudes that we have, and then the character that we have. And that's what wisdom really is about. How, I mean, here he keeps you saying, how the rubber meets the road. Okay? So two types of wisdom. First, we're going to look at worldly wisdom. And the character of this worldly wisdom. So in verse... 14, we'll start with 14, we find the character of worldly wisdom, wisdom that does not come from God. But if you harbor bitter, bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come from heaven. So bitter envy, that's, that's the first one. Envy is, is a wrongful desire for something that another person has. There can, there can be a way that you desire what somebody else wants in a good way. But envy is a wrongful desire where your attitude's all wrong. And James adds the word bitter to it to, to, to show the attitude that we, that we have that when we don't have this thing that that person has. We're bitter, we're resentful, we're kind of just a little bit grumpy whenever it comes up or something like that. And um, there, there, I, I read the story about uh, two men who came to a king once. They were called before a king. One of the men was incredibly envious. He envied everything that everybody else had. But the king said, I will give you two men whatever you wish. You can, you can have whatever you wish with one stipulation. One of you will choose first. And the person who chooses first will get what he wishes but the other person will get twice what you wish. Well, the envious person got to choose first. And he, he's thinking about this. If I choose, let's say, a billion dollars, that means he gets two million dollars. <laughs> and he, he was just beside himself. What do I do? Finally he said, I would like one of my eyes plucked out. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he was so envious that the only way he could answer the question was to, to make the other guy suffer twice as much. And, and, and you know, sometimes we, we, we do this too. I mean, not with eyes being plucked out, hopefully. Uh, but ever since kids, we've, we've done stuff like, well, if I can't have the toy, no one gets a toy and you throw it off the cliff and break it, you know? We've done that, and we do that. We're so envious, we're so selfish, that we get bitter about it. And when we decide nothing is better than something, so that no one can have anything. And then there's selfish ambition. And selfish ambition can be defined as a, a prideful inner desire to promote, one, to promote oneself or one's concerns without reference to God or the genuine needs of others. That's selfish ambition. Um, and, and I like that definition. I, I like that definition a lot because there is a good type of ambition. Uh, it's an ambition that wants to glorify God and help others. And to, to be, Paul says in Titus, zealous for good works, right? And so there's a type of ambition that's good. But, but this type of selfish ambition isn't good. It, it's focused on only yourself and, and what you want. And so if the wisdom that you are following leads you to bitter envy or selfish ambition, um, then that wisdom is worldly wisdom. That wisdom is ungodly. That wisdom is just plain wrong. So that's one way you can tell if you're following worldly wisdom. It is if what you're thinking, your ideas and so forth, your attitude and your actions are leading you to bitter envy and selfish ambition, then you're on the wrong path. You've got the wrong wisdom. You've hooked up to the wrong um, channel or whatever it is. And, and 
furthermore, if the people that you follow, if the people that you follow and consider wise, whether it's the people on, on, on I don't know, news or the internet or um, at work or whatever, if, if, if they are people who are constantly bitter and envious and so, uh, full of selfish ambition, then, then you don't want to be following those people. Look, look at a person's attitude and look at a person's actions and their, 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 their character. And maybe you say, well, the person's doing a lot of good for the community or whatever. But they're following worldly wisdom. And we don't want to be doing that. What, because, because of the source of worldly, worldly wisdom. Um, verse 15. Look at that verse again. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but, James says, is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. Earthly, earthly means that it, it doesn't have um, a heavenly point of view. Okay? It's focused on what you can see and not, you know, we say we need to walk by faith, not by sight. Worldly wisdom walks by sight, not by faith. Okay? If you look in the vice columns, um, you often find this sort of worldly wisdom in spouse, right? I want to move in with my boyfriend. I don't know if it's a good idea or not. The Bible is very simple. Are you married? Don't do it. Okay. The vice columnist goes off and says, well, you know, um, how's your feelings about that? And, and have you worked out whether or not you have a good way of separating? And how are you keeping your boundaries and, and stuff like that? It, it's all about us. It's all about how... Um, how we respond on earth, and that's earthly wisdom. It's also unspiritual, um, meaning it's devoid of the Spirit of God. This is the same word used in 1 Corinthians 2.14. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. Um, unspiritual is the same word as natural. And so it really comes back to the same thing, is that this is just earthly wisdom. This is uh, the stuff that we are getting without a reference to God, without a reference to the Holy Spirit. And even it's demonic. Um, worldly wisdom is ultimately from Satan. It's ultimately promoted by Satan. Okay? It, it's the stuff he wants us to do. And he's going to make us think it's a good way. It's a good thing to do. But worldly wisdom is demonic. When you have an idea that you know in the back of your mind God doesn't approve of, but you've rationalized it. You think, well, God in this instance will probably want me to do this because, and then we have all sorts of things that we can say that end justifies the means or uh, it's a lesser of two evils or something like that, right? We have all ways, sorts of ways of justifying ourselves um, that it's that it's necessary for us to be happy and safe you know if, if, if we don't you know skim a little bit off the top here we, we won't have enough finances to get to the year we won't be safe or or if if, if I do move in with my uh, boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever, then, then that will make me happy. And God will want me to be happy. No, when you are following worldly wisdom, you are following Satan. Yeah, that's what it comes down to. Results of worldly wisdom, whenever you see disorder, whenever you see evil practices, whenever you see um, people um, at each other's throats, calling each other names, um, scrounging for, for their little bit of the pie. 
what you're seeing is worldly wisdom. It's pretty easy to see. Not God's wisdom. Well, let's turn and look at godly wisdom. What is the source of godly wisdom? And, and we find that in verse 17a. But the wisdom that comes from heaven, what is the source of godly wisdom? It's from heaven. It's from God. It says, our video says, heavenly wisdom, um, godly wisdom is from God. It's from his word. Um, it's from heaven above. Now, 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 what does that mean in our lives? It, it means that it's something that unless you are a Christian, godly wisdom doesn't make sense to you. Paul goes on this um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 2. He says, for instance, he says, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The unbeliever looks at the gospel and, and says, that's stupid. Why would a guy have to die for my sins? That doesn't seem to fix my problems, and so forth. But, but God says, that is the power of God to save you. So if you've never, uh, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you know, it may on the surface sound like, why would they want to do that? What's he going to give me? Well, he'll give you eternal life. Well, he will he give me a good house? I don't know. I'm not going to say that. Uh, he will provide for you. Will it be free from pain and persecution? Probably not. Uh, especially if you live all out for him. But he will give you eternal life. That's the crazy thing about godly wisdom. It seems crazy to us. It doesn't seem very practical to us sometimes. But it is the truth. Um, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, the natural person does not accept the Spirit of God, for they are folly, they are foolishness to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. So, so once again, we have this dichotomy, this, this separation. There's natural people, unbelievers, who look at God's word. And, and maybe they can read the words on the page, they can understand what it says, but it doesn't have any significance for them. It's foolishness to them. And the reason is that in order to have godly wisdom, you need to be um, a Christian who is going to the Word, going to God, to get that wisdom. God's wisdom is going to seem like foolishness to the non-Christian, and God's wisdom often seems like foolishness to Christians as well. And why? Well, because we have the sinful nature in us. Because we look around and, you know, we've spent five minutes or even half an hour in the, in the Word of God, but we spend the rest of the 24 hours a day looking around at the world, seeing worldly wisdom in action, which is going to influence you more. It's a way that we're taught from a young age. Look out for number one. Uh, don't let anybody push you around. And those sorts of things, all those little wise sayings that, 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 that we give young people and tell young people, but that they're not God's wisdom. They're not God's wisdom. God's wisdom, because it comes from heaven, seems unnatural to us. Even sometimes as Christians, even as Christians, we look at this and we go, God, I know what you want me to do. But it just seems a little bit risky, <laughs> right? Yeah. And, but that's godly wisdom. That's a source of godly wisdom. Now let's look at the character of godly wisdom. And it's got a different character than, than worldly wisdom. 
let's, verse 13, we start to see this character come out. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show up by their good life, by deeds done in humility that come from wisdom. What, what, is, it, what is the first thing that you think of when, when you think of wisdom? Well, you think of some, like I was saying in the introduction, of some wise thing that this person said. He was so wise. He said this, and I've lived by it ever since. But, but James uh, says that if you are wise, then what's going to happen is that you will see that wisdom in your good life, in your deeds, and in humility that comes from wisdom. Okay? So, so it's going to be the attitudes and the actions and, and even the character that you have in your life that other people see, that other people will be go, just looking at your life and go, oh, that's what I want. That's what I want. The first one on the list here is humility, okay? And humility is, is the quality of not, not being overly impressed with yourself. I like that definition of humility. <laughs> the quality of not being overly impressed by yourself, with yourself, uh, or by a sense of, of one's self-importance as a dictionary that I looked up, um, Greek dictionary said, godly wisdom is going to come across humbly, okay? It's, it's going to be like Jesus washing the disciples' feet. And, and did the disciples think that was really cool? No. They thought it was crazy. Why are you doing this? This is crazy. When Ray did it to me, when he insulted me, I really did think he was a little bit crazy. I think you really want to do this. You don't need to do this. But that, that's humility. We look at humility, and um, whenever someone talks about being humble, someone else has to come along and say, well, you don't want to be a doormat. We've always got to correct God's wisdom. Right? Because, because God's wisdom can't be perfect, can it? Yes, it can. But we're always correcting it. Now, he can't be totally humble. That would, that would be bad. He would get run over. The church needs people like this. People who are willing to live humble lives and show humble deeds that are controlled by humble, godly wisdom. Our nation needs this. We need people, we need leaders who are humble, who are humble and controlled by humble, godly wisdom. Okay? Otherwise, we'll continue to go downtown. Uh, if my people are repent and are humble, and come before me, I will heal their land. The character traits continue in verse 17. Wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. So pure. God and his wisdom are free from fault, without deficiency and devoid of anything sinful. So in other words, if you have this idea, you think it's wise, but it involves you being just a little bit sinful, that little white line, it's not godly wisdom. Because godly wisdom will be pure. Peace loving. Jesus wants us to be peace at peace with everyone, including our enemies. He says in Matthew 5.44, but I tell you, Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. And Jesus was speaking it to disciples who ended up being killed by their enemies. I mean, most of us, probably none of us, have, I can say for sure, that none of us in this room have been killed by our enemies. Okay? <laughs> Much less 
persecuted to the degree that the disciples were. And yet Jesus told them, love your enemies. Uh, what if your enemies won't be at peace with you? This is, this is what we come back to because sometimes our enemies, sometimes the people that we're trying to be at peace with simply won't be at peace with you. And that's what Paul says, if, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, be, live at peace with everyone. So, so do what you can, wave high, smile, whatever it takes to be at peace with your enemy, um, and then leave it with God. The point is, what your attitude is, are you actually peace loving in your heart? Do you want that peace? Or are you more inclined to conflict? conflict? It's amazing how many people I talk to who when someone wrongs them, a doctor makes what they think is a wrong call, and I'm not saying if it's right or wrong, how mad they are at that doctor, how upset they are with this person for doing this or that person. And it seems like they don't want to be at peace anymore. They simply want the conflict. And they're willing to tell everybody who they mean about what, how much they don't like this person anymore. Is your nature peace-loving? Or are you inclined towards conflict? The character traits continue. Considerate uh, or gentle, kind to other people. Um, one, one pastor was talking, um, reading about, said that he worked with a pastor he worked under a pastor for about nine years. And in those nine years, he saw that, you know, there were conflicts and, and there were people who said bad things about this pastor and so forth. But what he noticed is that whenever the subject came up, this pastor would never join in with the others about putting that person down. Instead, he would deflect and he would be considered and he would be gentle and he would say, well, well they were suffering from this issue or, or you don't know how many problems they were dealing with um, at the time and, and so forth. He would be considerate of them and that's what that means. Submissive, the ESV translates this as open to reason or uh, another translation could be reasonable. And, and, and as I was thinking about this, I realized that if you are open to reason, if you're going to be reasonable, what's one thing that you have to do? Listen. You have to listen. In fact, James says in James 1.19, remember, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. So it was on James's mind as well, I think, here. Um, we need to be able, if, if you're going to be open to reason, if you're going to be um, this sort of person, then, then you need to be willing to listen to them. Full of mercy and good fruit. Be, being, it really comes down to being willing to help those who don't deserve your help. We have a hard time with that, don't we? <laughs> Being willing to show mercy to someone who really doesn't show mercy, doesn't deserve any mercy. They're, they're on drugs, they're high, they're, you know, they're bad at their finances, they're, they're evil to this person or whatever. They're, they smell bad, they're really dumb and stuff like that. We can come up with all sorts of reasons why we shouldn't show a person mercy. But that's what godly wisdom would have us do. There's a story about Napoleon who was, uh, who had a soldier who, who had on his second fence done something and Napoleon ordered him executed. And the soldier's mother came to Napoleon and begged for the soldier's life. And, and Napoleon said, there's really nothing I can do. He did this wrong. Justice needs to be done. 
The mother said, yes, you're right, but I'm not asking for justice. I'm asking for mercy. That's what mercy is. Giving somebody the mercy they need, even when they don't deserve it. Impartial. The Greek word here is only used once, and so it's kind of hard to really figure out the exact meaning. Uh, it can mean non-judgmental, it can mean not divisive, it could even mean unwavering, and so like your New American Standard Bible will have without doubting. I'm going to take it to be impartial because just a few, just in the last chapter, uh, James gave a great illustration of being impartial, or being partial rather, and the need to to be impartial. James chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. My brothers and sisters, believers in our Lord, glorious Lord Jesus Christ, must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and the poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, Here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated? Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? James is saying, don't do that. I mean, how tempted are we when somebody comes in and they smell bad and, and they're wearing raggedy clothes, but another person comes in who's finely dressed and has a suit and tie and everything, we think, well, what would be better for the um, offering plate? This man or that man? And so who do we give the attention to? And, and we do this in our lives. We show partiality to the people who we think will benefit us the most instead of being impartial and open to what God would have us do with either one in the lives of either one. Sincere. Basically, this is about the masks that we wear. A sincere, a sincere person is someone who is the same on the outside as they are on the inside. Their, their heart is on their sleeve, in other words. No, they don't share every single thought they have, and, and they don't share every, every little thing about their lives. That's not what I'm saying, but... Basically, they never have to pretend. They are who they are, and you know what you see is what you get. W S I G, okay? W S W I G. Um, so they're sincere, and that's godly wisdom. So those are the character traits of godly wisdom. What what, what does godly wisdom result in? Then? And I, I found this picture, and I was thinking about farming. And what does a farmer, in his farming wisdom, if you, if you will, aim for? He, he aims for a good crop. He aims for a crop that grows evenly, grows well, that produces 30, 60, 100 fold. He, he aims for wheat with high protein content. He aims for a good yield. What doesn't he do? In his farming wisdom, he doesn't aim for, for a field that has big bare spots and, and some is half grown and some is grown up a little bit and, and, and the weed is all withered and so forth. No farmer would want to aim for that, right? Well, what about us? When we follow the world's wisdom, what's our field going to look like? What will it look like? It's going to be full of bitterness. It will be full of envy. It will be full of, you go to Galatians chapter 5, verse 19, and find all the works of the flesh. And that's what your field will look like. It will be full of bad choices, poor choices, um, of heartaches and, and, and broken relationships and so forth. And why will we want to aim for that? But that's what we get when we follow worldly wisdom. But James says, verse 18, 
peacemakers, he picks up on the peace-loving idea, peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. That's what we should be aiming for in our lives. That's what we want to have growing in our lives, is this, this harvest of righteousness, 30, 60, 100 fold. That's, that's what we should want. And that's what godly wisdom, when we follow it, will provide for us. That will be the result for us. I love Psalm 1. I've been working on rememorizing it because I kind of lost it over the time. But this, the last few weeks, Psalm 1, blessed is the one who does not walk and step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law he meditates day and night. And he will be like, a, that person will be like a tree planted by streams of water, which brings forth its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. That's what we want. And, and if you look at it, we will be blessed when? When we refuse to walk in the way of worldly wisdom, when we refuse to stand in, in, in the way of worldly wisdom, when we refuse to sit in the company of the worldly wise. We will be blessed. And we will be blessed when we take God's word as true for all situations. When we don't go, well, I know what God says in this word and everything, but in this situation, it's different. And, and, and when we meditate constantly on how to apply it to our lives, when it, when it becomes more than just a, yeah, I read my daily bread this morning, but when we meditate on this word of God day and night, instead of just leaving it in church on Sunday morning, that's when we will find our fields and our trees growing as if they were planted by streams of water. Let's pray. Oh. Yeah. Father, thank you for thank you for your wisdom. And James also tells us that if any of us lacks wisdom, we should just come to you and ask for it. You're ready to provide for it. And yet we often go down our own route. We go down our own roads. We, we pursue the worldly wisdom instead, even as Christians. Yet you're there and, and, and it says that you give generously those who ask for this wisdom. Lord, help us to, to first of all, just come to you more often and all the time for your wisdom. Well, Lord, we also have seen today that the wisdom has different characteristics if it's worldly or if it's godly. And so, Lord, I pray that the, the character of, of godly wisdom will be the character that's growing in our lives and not, 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 not the worldly wisdom, not the bitterness and the envy and the other works of the flesh, but basically what we've been looking at is the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Lord, I pray for that in our lives and in the lives of this, this group of believers gathered here today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand for the benediction. This one's already been mentioned a couple times today, Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or even imagine, according to his power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, 